Hello and welcome everybody to our webinar about the recently published Target A trial. Today's webinar will focus on the long-term results of Target A from a radiation and efficiency perspective. It is our pleasure to have with us today Professor Jeffrey Tobias. He is Professor of Oncology at UCL, London, and Consultant in Clinical Oncology at UCLH in the UK. He is the joint initiator of the Target A trial. After his presentation, we will have a panel discussion with Professor Jeffrey Tobias, Professor Max Bolsara, and Professor Jayant Y. Dia. With this, I would like to hand over to Professor Tobias. The audience is yours. Thank you, Bridget, uh, and good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much to Zeiss Meditech for arranging this webinar. And I've uh, put on the front slide, as you see, uh, not only the title, long-term results, etc., but also I'm suggesting that this might be a webinar-based conversation. You could call it a seminar. I prefer to call it a conversation. Um, I will, uh, of course, go through some of the headline results of the study, which was published in the British Medical Journal last month. But just before I do that, I want to say one or two things about the difficulties relating to radiotherapy as we have come to know it over so many years. Uh, all of you who treat uh, radio, uh, treat breast cancer with external beam radiotherapy will be well aware of the problems which even today still persist. Uh, it typically takes three or more weeks to deliver. I know that things are changing and more compressed, uh, more rapidly delivered treatment programs are now becoming more popular, although there is no long-term evidence about these, not to the same level of uh, information that we would normally regard as necessary. Patients, of course, don't like the delays from surgery to radiotherapy consultation, to radiotherapy planning, to radiotherapy treatment, which inevitably takes weeks, if not months. They don't like the multiple daily visits. It's a huge workload for uh, departments of radiotherapy, which of course to, uh, contributes uh, in some countries, including, I must say, uh, sadly, the UK, to quite long waiting lists, which often uh, uh, extend over months in some centers. And we also know, and those of you who heard Professor Vaidya speaking last week, uh, heard that even today, and even in uh, advanced uh, societies, advanced economies, geography can still prevent patients from happily accepting uh, the uh, post-breast conservation treatment with extended uh, radiotherapy. There are the usual skin reactions, we know all about that, and I won't go into details because I think you're all well aware of it. The other point, which I think really is important, is that uh, there's no question many patients now with small uh, tumours, screen detected tumours, ER positive tumours, unifocal tumours, etc. Many of these patients are grossly overtreated using current radiotherapy techniques, which I sometimes refer to rather unkindly, but I think accurately, as a one size fits all approach. Now, I say this as someone who is a passionate believer in the modality of radiation therapy. I've been a consultant at UCH for very nearly 40 years, so I'm well aware of the pluses, but you don't need a sledgehammer to crack a nut, as we often say, and these are patients where the one size fits all approach, I think is far too severe. I will come back to that point. Uh, I want to actually just remind you about uh, something else, which is that in most areas of practice, we radiation oncologists are absolutely obsessed with precision and with the avoidance of treatment of normal tissues. But somehow, breast cancer treatment seems to have slipped through the net. Curiously, we rather ignore the normal breast tissues, which we know actually do not need treatment. Why do I say that? because over 90% of recurrences 
if they do occur, occur in the index quadrant. And we now absolutely recognize that. So question, why treat the whole breast necessarily? And I'll remind you also that the breast is not an easy organ to irradiate. It's not uh, regular in its outline, in its contour. Uh, there are important organs at risk. We all know about OAR in our radiation dosimetry. Organs at risk, including the heart, the lungs, and other structures within the chest wall. So scattered radiation, although of course precision techniques of today reduce this to a minimum, are still uh, not an insignificant problem. And so this is why we have to expect to see late onset side effects, which include contralateral breast cancers from the scattered radiation uh, and also heart disease. And I want to just uh, clarify and amplify these points just a little bit. They tend to be long-term problems, but we now recognize that you can identify some of these within as little as five years after treatment of the breast cancer. This is a famous paper from the Oxford group, Sarah Darby and colleagues, which looked uh, in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine at the ischemic heart disease, showing that there was an increase following radiotherapy and that that was identifiable within the first five years and continuing for far longer. Then we have the problem of the second cancers, and this paper and several others came out at much the same time. Uh, the previous one was 2013, I think this is 2014. And the fact is that although the risks in absolute terms may be small, there is most, ser most definitely a long-term adverse consequence in respect of second cancers at a later stage. And this was uh, uncovered by uh, Jens Overgaard and colleagues uh, who say, as you see there, EBRT for breast cancer is significantly associated with increase, increased risks. And the point I've made here at the bottom, uh, highlighted in red, is a reminder that none of these cancers, which are radiation induced uh, and may be small in their absolute numbers, that these are tumors occurring predominantly in the central mediastinum, lung, and esophagus, and soft tissue sarcoma, all of which, particularly at this central site, are likely to have a poor prognosis, very sadly, a fatal prognosis. And this is an illustration from the uh, Jens uh, uh, Overgaard and Tina Grantzal work of a forest plot for lung cancer. And you see on the right hand side of the ISO effect line, a demonstration that the number of cancers is greater, quite significantly greater. That is lung cancer. This is esophageal cancer. And finally, I show you the soft tissue sarcoma. And all of those panels, all of these, yes, small absolute numbers may be, but how tragic when a patient who has been treated very successfully for a small, very good prognosis, carcinoma, at the age of, say, 65, not uncommon problem, by the age of 78, 79, 80, otherwise fit and healthy, develops what will sadly be a fatal late onset radiation-induced cancer. So these are formidable problems, and they led us to think seriously about the concept of intraoperative radiotherapy as, be, as being one means of treating just the limited portion of the breast. Uh, and as they point out, Grantsau and Overgaard, the challenge is to reduce the delivered dose to avoid radiation-induced cancers without compromising the efficacy. So a couple of slides here. Why take the concept of intraoperative radiotherapy seriously at all? Well, the timeliness of radiotherapy for a start, you give the radiotherapy immediately after the surgical excision. And then secondly, in my view, the really wonderful precision of placement of the radiotherapy within the surgical cavity, within the wound, not only immediately, not only during the same anesthetic, but precisely to the right area of the breast, which is at risk. 
So this is what we did. This is now coming to the few slides I'll show you as a reminder of the study. We randomized between single dose target radiotherapy using intrabeam immediately after surgical excision uh, and the one size fits all radiotherapy standard EBRT. When I say one size fits all, of course, I just like the rest of you, I do an individual dosimetric plan for every single patient. That goes without saying, that's a given. But nonetheless, having made the decision about which patients require external beam radiotherapy in the traditional setting, yes, the dosimetry is individualized, but the dose level and the coverage of the organ is not. We also said in the target group that if we identified high risk features on the pathology review specimen, usually available about a week later, if we identified high risk factors, perhaps uh, higher risk factors than had been uh, identifiable with the needle biopsy, pre-operative needle biopsy, then we would consider external beam radiotherapy as well. It's a point I'm sure we'll discuss more with Professor Vaidya and Professor Balsara in the, in the uh, discussion period, but we hypothesized that this might be necessary in around about 15 to 20% of patients. And it turns out that that was uh, correct and uh, that about 20% of the patients in the target group received additional EBRT as well. This is not a conflict uh, that does not break or uh, minimize the protocol. It does not mean that the patient comes off study. This was something which was agreed in advance and is part of what we did. It was intended. That is what we mean by risk adapted radiotherapy. So I'll say it now, and I may well say it again. It means that eight out of 10 patients never needed to come near the radiotherapy department. In other words, after the pathology review, it was clear that our initial preoperative needle assessment was perfectly accurate and that these were patients for whom there was no need for additional external beam radiotherapy. Eight out of 10 patients, radiotherapy by intraoperative single shot alone, two of the 10 patients requiring external beam radiotherapy. Total number of patients in this randomized trial, as you see at the bottom there, 2,298. Now, these are not patients with a profoundly, outstandingly excellent, lowest risk of all type of prognosis. And I just wanted to point that out. They are, of course, good prognosis patients. They all have uh, invasive ductal carcinoma, unifocal, treatable by surgical breast conservation, etc. But uh, as you see there, 86% were younger than the age of 70 years. Uh, two thirds had tumors over the size of one centimeter. 16% had tumors over the size of two centimeters. A fifth of our patients, 20%, had grade three lesions. 21% were ER, uh, were uh, node positive, and 91%, as you see, were ER positive. Therefore, 9% uh, were ER negative. So although this is a good prognosis group, it is not highly, highly, high, highly selected in that sense. And again, uh, a point for later, perhaps, offering supplemental EBRT was a decision made by the local multidisciplinary team and in discussion with the patient. And I will just say at this point that uh, when we looked at this data, we discovered that uh, supplemental EBRT was not given, and this was the choice of the MDT and the patient, to almost 80% of patients who had grade three lesions, to 82% of patients with uh, ER negative tumors, and to two thirds of patients with a, a positive axillary node. So we trusted and respected our colleagues in our collaborating centers to make what seemed to be a sensible decision in the individual case. 
Well, the results, I think you know about the results, I won't dwell on this, but uh, in uh, respect of local recurrence, we are perfectly satisfied that the difference was very well within the 2.5% level of uh, non-inferiority, which was the which was the, in the uh, SAP and uh, was agreed right at the start of the trial. This, by the way, is a very stringent criterion looking for non-inferiority at the 2.5% level. Um, if uh, you think about, for example, the Elliott trial in Italy, which uh, is much discussed and well known, I think the non-inferiority level there was set at 7%. So we are much tighter than that in uh, our demand to ourselves, as it were. And as you see, the difference in terms of local recurrence between target IORT and external beam uh, turned out to be 1.16% at five years, uh, which is, of course, very much lower than the 2.5% which we set for ourselves. In a nutshell, here are the results. Uh, you all know this in terms of local recurrence-free survival, no difference, mastectomy-free survival between the two arms, no difference, breast cancer mortality, most important, no difference, but non-breast cancer mortality, we have uncovered an important difference with the target group doing better than the external beam group, and I've just highlighted that point in this next slide non-breast cancer mortality on the left with quite a difference in favor of target and this relates of course to such things as cardiovascular problems fatalities second cancer problems fatalities uh, and that seems to drift in towards the overall mortality as well i won't dwell on that point at this stage so the first patient was randomized in 2000 we published in The Lancet 10 years later in 2010. We were delighted to see that The Lancet put us on its front page with a recommendation that this treatment be taken very seriously. But I think the world was waiting for the late mature results. And we have published that, as I say, last month in the British Medical Journal with the long-term uh, median survival, uh, median follow-up now of nine years or thereabouts. Just to remind you what I said before, why take the concept of intraoperative radiotherapy seriously? The timeliness, uh, it avoids delays, which are inevitable even in the uh, best possible circumstances. And also this third point here about surgical trauma, that's something which uh, Jayant Vaidya and colleagues in Italy, uh, uh, Belletti, and uh, Samuel Masarut have looked at in some detail, and he told you about that last week, but there is evidence that surgical trauma permits or even stimulates cancer cell escape, and furthermore, that immediate irradiation can help to avoid or abrogate this problem. Number two, the precision of radiotherapy, immediate intraoperative radiotherapy, as I mentioned before. Number three, We've seen from our studies, and this is published work, that there is a better outcome, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, but it, it was important to demonstrate it, uh, from intraoperative radiotherapy as compared with external beam. It doesn't significantly irradiate the skin, unlike external beam radiotherapy. And many patients really like the fact that there's no permanent tattoo. Some patients find this quite objectionable. If you're looking at yourself in the mirror, you're having a shower in the morning. I'm sure for some women, it's the first thing you see. It's regrettable, but there it is. And don't forget that as time goes by with conventional external beam radiotherapy, and I have seen over 40 years, many such patients, the asymmetry between the normal, inevitably increasing ptosis of the untreated breast compared with the rather more fibrosed static uh, breast which has been treated, uh, the asymmetry becomes more pronounced and we've looked at this in some detail and this illustration is taken from one of those publications. Number four, there are many economic benefits. One could talk for hours about this, but I will just say 
that uh, in all developed nations there's been an increasing expenditure on health care over the past three or four decades. Of course, we all know that. Uh, Target requires minimal shielding. Most important point this, it can be done in a standard operating room. Of course, there's a capital investment. It is recouped after three or four years. And of course, the intraoperative um, uh, technology can be used for other indications, including kyphoplasty for vertebral metastases or for gynecological applications as well. And from the patient's point of view, it goes without saying uh, they're much happier, they travel less, less time off work, etc. We've looked at patient preference, we've looked at patient satisfaction. I won't go into this in detail, uh, but it's interesting that patients are prepared to put up with a rather more significant difference uh, in local recurrence rates than we would have accept, uh, expected, and that in order to have this benefit of simple single treatment, they would be willing to go up to perhaps 5%, which we thought was, so I personally thought was surprisingly high, but that's a, a point for discussion perhaps later. Better quality of life, no question. Uh, most studies in breast cancer are not very well validated, but again, we've done studies, we've looked at this, there are studies now from Germany and from Australia, um, and it does look as though, without doubt, the single treatment, as you might expect, does confer a significantly better quality of life in the end. Now, point number seven, I think, is really, really important. If the patient's previously had radiotherapy, and we've all seen patients like this, the standard treatment, if there is a recurrence, is, of course, mastectomy. With intraoperative radiotherapy, you often, I won't say sometimes, I will say often, are able to remove the uh, offending tumor, providing, of course, it's unifocal, and then give intraoperative radiotherapy to the standard dose without any particular problems. It's a huge plus for many patients. We've even done this twice in the same breath, uh, breast in perhaps three or four patients. It can also be given to women who are, shall we say, not entirely suitable, and in some cases absolutely unsuitable for external beam radiotherapy, uh, I've put a little list here, and these are all patients who either I or my immediate colleagues have actually seen for ourselves. Systemic lupus, collagen disorders, myasthenia gravis, motor neurone disease, Parkinson's disease. Marvellous if the patient cannot avoid shaking and has, to, has great problems of immobility uh, on the radiotherapy machine. What a plus to have it all done under the anaesthetic spondylitis, obesity, severe cardiovascular or respiratory disease, etc., cetera, et cetera. These, um, these, This is quite a list, and actually the last one there, agoraphobia, uh, I had a patient uh, who, when I told her that she was suitable for this type of treatment, got up in my consulting room with her husband and started to dance a little jig. Uh, <laughs> I was rather surprised and said, well, many patients are pleased to be offered this, but what, what's so special? And she said, doctor, I haven't told you my full medical history. I am profoundly agoraphobic. To get me here to your consulting room this morning was a major effort. And the idea of coming on 15 or 20 occasions for radiotherapy is completely beyond me. I certainly would have agreed to a mastectomy. So there we are. You, you, uh, as they sometimes say, you couldn't make this up. Of course, we're within the COVID era, era, and sadly, this is going to go on and on and on. So there's an obvious advantage. Uh, I won't dwell on this. A huge advantage in having the treatment in a single se session under the anesthesia. Eight out of 10 patients don't need to come back because they don't need external beam radiotherapy. It's terrific. Query, better overall survival. It's a point which I briefly alluded to before. So we did a meta-analysis looking at all the studies of partial breast irradiation just to see if there was anything which fell out of that. Why did we do it? Because uh, at the five-year result point, we did think that we saw a signal 
of improved overall survival. Uh, and there was no statistically significant difference in local recurrence, and we saw fewer overall deaths. Is it plausible? We think so, because I'll remind you of the New England uh, uh, Journal of Medicine slide, uh, Sarah Darby and her colleagues in Oxford, showing that there was a small uh, increase in mortality from ischemic events, uh, even as early as five years. Here's the point, the mortality from breast cancer continues to fall. We see more and more screen detected cases. Patients have a good prognosis. So recognizing the harms of treatment, the toxicity is profoundly important. And partial breast irradiation, of which of course, intraoperative target radiotherapy is one example. I personally think the very best example, this will reduce exposure of other organs to radiation. So this is what we did. We compared all of the parcel breast with all of the whole breast studies, and uh, I won't go into the, into the details, but we looked at uh, nine randomized control trials at the five-year point, mortality just under 5%. P, partial breast, was better than W, whole breast, for overall mortality no difference in breast cancer mortality, better for non-breast cancer mortality. In other words, exactly the same signal that we ourselves have found. And this is a compilation of forest plot of all of those studies put together, those nine randomized trials where we had useful information. And as you see, the total deaths overall favors partial breast irradiation. So I think perhaps it's reasonable to say that there's an improvement in survival. Uh, this is probably the most contentious point, but it certainly looks that way. Uh, obviously much better for the environment, far fewer road journeys, less in the way of vehicle emissions. Jay Ann Fidia went into that last time. In fact, uh, on one occasion when I gave a talk of this kind uh, a couple of years ago in Stockholm, this is what really lit up the ecologically conscious uh, Swedish audience, this point about the uh, reduction in vehicle emissions. This is not a trivial uh, point. It's not just good for the patient, it's extremely good for the environment as well. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, we would say that target is the only intraoperative technique that's capable of delivering x-rays within a standard operating theater and is supported now without doubt by level one evidence from a major uh, well-conducted large-scale uh, prospective randomized study. Many benefits. There are other studies which we're recruiting which we might discuss briefly in the panel discussion. Oh well now uh, the title of the talk included the word drawbacks. Well what are they? Well, I think this is really important. We have to think in a new way as radiation oncologists. We have to, I think, disregard a good deal of what we thought we knew about how to treat early breast cancer. It is indeed a lot to get your head around. For example, is local recurrence a strong surrogate for survival? We think the answer is actually no. Can we accept the concept of IORT even when not every histological detail is available? which is of course the point we are arguing, because all we have is the needle biopsy. Answer, a most definite yes. Other drawbacks, capital cost of equipment, we can talk about that, the maintaining of the equipment, the departmental disruption, because of course if you alter a workflow of what is undoubtedly the commonest of the work streams in a radiotherapy department, there are very serious consequences. The reduction in costs overall is tremendous, but it does place pressure on a fee-for-service type uh, of activity. Uh, okay, I will go on now just to remind you that this is where we were years and years ago with our traditional approach. Actually, I can't resist showing you this little bit of history. This is the wonderful Dr. Georges Chicoteau, treating, I think, probably almost the very first patient with breast cancer with external beam radiotherapy within a decade or, or little after a decade from the discovery of x-rays. I love his top hat. I love his surgical gown. 
And I'll tell you one extra thing. He was an artist as well as a surgeon and a radiation oncologist. He actually painted this as a self-portrait with patient. That was 1907. Then my personal hero, Sir Geoffrey Keynes, whom I met, consultant surgeon at St. Bartholomew's, was the first to recognize the terrible mutilating damage of radical mastectomy and treated patients instead with a series of radium needles. So I think we've now moved from what Professor Keynes did to this very elegant approach that we now have with the uh, intrabeam. Uh, this is a picture I took in the operating theater of our very first case, which Jayant will remember. Jayant Vaidya, Professor Michael Baum, our physics and dosimetric colleagues. That was the first case in humans uh, 22 years ago, and we now have 250 centers, 38 countries offering target uh, IRT, IRT for breast cancer, 44,500 patients treated. Thank you so much to our patients. Thank you so much to our colleagues. Thank you to the trials team and uh, thank you for your attention. I think you've listened to me long enough. Now time for the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tobias. This was a great presentation and a great overview of all the uh, surrounding data. Um, very well um, appreciated. I have one first question, which is, I think it's for you, Professor um, Vaidia. Um, how does the study target A compare to the no radiation uh, trials like PRIME and BASO? Well, uh, this is a very important question. Uh, the PRIME, BASO2 and CALGB were randomized clinical trials uh, comparing radiotherapy with no radiotherapy after breast cancer and surgery. The eligibility criteria for these trials was extremely stringent. The patients had to be over the age of 60, uh, 65 or sometimes 70. Their grades had to be one or two. And if they were uh, either grade three or LVI, they were excluded in prime two, for example. They had to have ER positive tumors. They had to have clear margins. So they were highly selected patients. And even after such high sele highly selected patients, after having no radiotherapy, their five-year local recurrence rates was something like 4% and sometimes 6%. So if you have, think about that, four to 6%, that is two to three times more than the recurrence rate in the target IORT arm. Now in the target A trial, the patients were not so selected as Professor Tobias has just explained. A large proportion, a significant proportion of patients were grade three. Nearly 400 patients were there in each of the high-risk group, grade three or um, more than uh, two centimeters were near 366 patients. There were patients, a large number of patients were under the age of 70, and uh, they were not particularly selected in that manner. They were good prognosis, but not, not super selected. And despite this, the local recurrence rate at five years was just 2%. And importantly, the chance of a woman living without local recurrence was the same throughout. At five years, it was exactly equal. So, uh, so there was no difference in that. So that is the benefit of having radiotherapy during surgery. And that's all the patient will need four out of the five times. So for the, as far as the patient is concerned, it is like no radiotherapy. There are no specifically higher uh, significant complications. So it has the benefit of having the radiotherapy at the same time, the benefit of not having to go back for radiotherapy all the time. So it's in a way, uh, 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 have your cake and eat it too. So I think that is the best way of putting it. Okay, thank you very much for your explanation. I hope this answers the questions um, to um, the one who has raised the question. I have another question, which I think is a statistical question, and it's yeah. for you, Zara. Um, is, is there, can you explain the um, confidence interval and the uh, inferiority margin again? Um, how does this relate to each other? Um, as in, um, 
uh, what level of confidence intervals we calculate for non-inferiority margins. I think one, one of the main problems people find uh, hard to understand is that for non-inferiority trials, they are a one tail test, not two tails. And usually we work out confidence intervals at the 90% level. This is what is recommended and this is what we have uh, reported. But a lot of the times people want to see 95% confidence intervals as well. So we have reported both in case you have a preference for 95%. But 90% is absolutely adequate. And in both ways, we had the same answer. Yeah. It, it didn't change the, the uh, results or it didn't um, uh, in any way um, alter uh, what we got as far as uh, trying to show non-inferiority for local recurrence for um, even for mortality, although the trial is designed specifically and par primarily for local recurrence. There's one extra point I quite like to make. It's very unusual for me to have the confidence to talk about something which is essentially a statistical uh, detail. But that is, why look at non-inferiority at all as our objective uh, yardstick or outcome indicator? My understanding is that you use non-inferiority in situations, clinical situations, where the advantages of the new treatment, provided that, of course, that it is uh, efficacious, as effective as the previous treatment, the advantages are so obvious from the point of view of patient convenience or uh, reduction in toxicity, et cetera, et cetera. That's why the concept of non-inferiority initially comes about and is used. It's only in situations like this where it's so evident that from the patient's point of view, provided that we can demonstrate similar efficacy, then the rest follows from there. Is that more or less right, Max? That's correct, Jeff. The, the idea is more to not to look at or uh, uh, try and establish superiority of a new treatment. We just want to show that it's as good as an existing treatment, but as far as cost is concerned, um, it, there may be advantages, uh, convenience uh, might be an issue, uh, patient preference might be uh, something that, that might need to be considered as well. So we're looking at it from that point of view rather than a, a superiority trial where we're trying to prove that the new treatment is far superior than the existing um, treatment. I'll speak more about it next week when, when I'm presenting my webinar and explain um, where because there is a lot of confusion about non-inferiority trials and where non-inferiority can be established or not established. Uh, and there are several scenarios uh, that I'll, I'll um, hypothetically put forward so that people can see and understand where uh, it's clear uh, non-inferiority has been established and where there is a gray area where it may or may not be the case. Yes. Yeah. This 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 question of potential superiority uh, has an important bearing on another study that's currently being undertaken, which is Target B, which Jay and Vidya can maybe remind us about, because this is an open study, I think, of some interest. This is for patients with a much higher risk of recurrence, uh, both uh, local recurrence and also distant recurrence for whom we are considering immediate uh, intraoperative radiotherapy in patients who almost certainly will all be getting some form of systemic treatment, very often uh, chemotherapy, and therefore their external beam radiotherapy, which all patients in the target B study will be receiving because they're at higher risk, but that external beam radiotherapy will inevitably be delayed. So the question which we're looking at and this is looking for, we hope, perhaps even superiority, is whether the addition of this immediate intraoperative radiotherapy randomized to the 50% group uh, uh, is of real value. Is that correct, Jay? Yes, that is correct. Uh, to continue on that, and I can see there is someone who is asking this question as well, so you answered it perfectly. Uh, so there are the update on target B trial, B standing for boost, is that now there are uh, 30, 35 centers who, are, who have been initiated into randomizing patients in the target B trial. 
and they are patients who would otherwise be excluded from target A trial. They are patients who are younger than 45, and <clears throat> 1,200 patients have already been randomized in this trial. Our aim is 1,796. So if there are anybody in the audience who are keen or know anyone who would like to participate, they're welcome to contact us. Now, one point I wanted to bring up in terms of this uh, question of non-inferiority. Although our primary outcome was non-inferiority, I believe that the patients and clinicians should focus on the absolute numbers. What we in fact really found is that the chance of a woman living without local recurrence was the same, not just at five years, but at 12 years. So the treatment is as effective in terms of patients being able to live without local recurrence, without having a mastectomy, without having distant disease. No difference, no difference in breast cancer mortality. And there was a difference in non-breast cancer mortality, which went up to four and, nearly four and a half percent at 12 years. So that is the ultimate message really, not really focusing on inferiority. We did mention about it, we analyzed it, remaining uh, uh, loyal to the primary outcome. But ultimately, what we are looking at is what patients and clinicians want to know. What is the chance of being without the disease for a long time? Can I just say that with the target B trial, which uh, as we've both mentioned is open up and running, and over halfway to recruitment now, we would re really love it if anybody interested would like to join us. And as a reminder, these are higher risk patients. Therefore, the data points, whether it's recurrence or distant disease, possibly even death, uh, will come much more rapidly than was the case for target A, which is why the total target number uh, using target in the normal sense of that word, target target number is considerably smaller than the 2298, which we looked at for target A. So please uh, let us know if you are interested in joining. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you also to the panelists to answer the questions. Um, I have, I think this should be one last question. Um, what is the um, the difference of target A, um, or how do you compare target A with the fast forward and rapid uh, scheme of radiation? Well, <laughs> I could, I could, I could ask you, Jay, to go for that first. <laughs> okay. Well, firstly, fast forward is not partial breast radiation at all. So that's one important point. It irradiates the whole breast. The results are only up to five years. And they found, uh, while, it, while it was efficacious, that, that there was significant, uh, we could see in terms of um, radiation toxicity because large doses are delivered every day from outside the breast to the whole breast. 25% um, of the patients reported the breast being hardened and uh, firm. And that was consistent with the clinician reported uh, outcome of having induration in the breast. So I am concerned about that. And we don't, and these in duration, as Professor Tobias will agree, um, uh, continues to get worse or doesn't really uh, go back to normal. In terms of rapid trial, also their cosmetic outcomes was worse, as far as I know. Um, and it does still involve uh, multiple visits to the hospital. Any of these other studies requires multiple visits. They say five or 10, and in some patients would require a boost. So that makes it to 15. In addition, there are visits for consultation with the, with, the, with, the, with the radiation oncologist, as well as the day for planning. So all of these increase the amount of exposure in these times to these vulnerable group of patients. A viral exposure, I think. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with all of, from the radiation oncologist's point of view, I, I agree with all of that. We simply haven't got the long-term data that we need uh, with fast forward, uh, for example, uh, the dose per day naturally is very much higher. Uh, the induration is greater. The discomfort is greater. Uh, I've seen patients treated this way with quite significant telangiectasia, which is something I don't ever, ever expect to see with intraoperative radiotherapy and not very commonly with a smaller dose per fraction in the old traditional way. Um, so I do have my real concerns about this compressed form of radiotherapy, particularly bearing in mind, of course, that 
so many patients have an absolute excellent prognosis. And I think one point we've not really mentioned, the sort of patients we now see that were the cohort within the target A study, more often die of something else and not the breast cancer. And that's a measure of how good the prognosis for early unifocal, small dimensional screen detected breast cancer is these days. So it brings us back to the problem of the potential harms or toxicities of treatment. And what I think we have to recognize that we are over-treating so many patients now. And although that was understood, I think, before the target results, people would shrug their shoulders and say, yes, we know it's true that we over-treat, but we don't know which patients we can afford to throttle back on, if you see what I mean. What our study has added is to say, oh yes, you do. Here are eight out of 10 patients treated this way who never needed radiotherapy at all. Any more radiotherapy at all? Any more radiotherapy at all, quite right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And indeed, yeah. for any of these other trials, other types of regimens, they are post-operative. Patients have to wait after the operation. And sometimes a patient whom I saw just two weeks ago said she had to, she was told she has to wait for three months for having her post-operative radiotherapy. So because of COVID, the waiting times have gone up and they have to wait for weeks and months sometimes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it's otherwise finished in the operation theater. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this is answering all the questions we had so far. With this, we would like to say Thank you to the panelists for your participation in our panel discussion today. And also thank you, Professor Dutbias, for your deep insights into the long-term results of Target A from a radiation and efficiency perspective. As our webinar is coming to an end now, we would like to thank you all for dialing in today. We hope you gained interesting insights you can directly apply into your clinical practice. And if you have any questions, please refer to our local size contact anytime.